Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to the broadcast. This is Evoke Therapy Program's open forum. So what that means is any live questions that come in, any pre-submitted questions, I'll be answering them. This is less of a formal format than some of our other formats where I present on the subject. So if you have questions, please feel free to submit them at any time. Malia, who is moderating for me this evening, will collect them and pass them on. We have some pre-submitted questions and leftover questions that we will get to first. Um, if you are not a parent, if you are a sibling or a grandparent or an uncle or an aunt, cousin, partner, even a friend, close family friend, please let us know that so I can uh, respond uh, with that in mind, with that context in mind. And also, if you're a sibling under the age of 25, let me know that when you're submitting a question. Another idea that I have for you is if you want to submit a question that family members or friends are asking you and you want to hear how I might answer the question, I'm happy to answer that question. So I'm going to get to the pre-submitted questions. Go ahead, Malia, when you when you have a moment, you can pass them pass those on and I'll, I'll, I'll get to those. All right, this, this question was pre-submitted. If you could go over how not to treat our children like objects, how to just hear them but not need them to change, that would be great. Isn't it normal to feel pain when our children are hurting? It is challenging for me to reconcile wanting them to be well and needing them to. I'll, I'll break this apart because I think there are a few elements to, to this question. First of all, let's talk about what I mean when we talk about objectifying children or turning them in, into objects. Objects. Let's dif differentiate object from subject. A subject in a psychological term is somebody who has agency. Somebody who is an independent self, who can choose, who's accountable for their reactions, for their choices in this world. Um, when somebody becomes an object, we treat them as if they're the outcome of a cause and effect equation. In other words, the example that I often give is the light switch on my wall over here in my office. If I go and tap it, the lights are going to go off. It has no choice in the matter. A human being has choice. Some of it might not be conscious. There might be some conditioning and some genetics, of course, that, that create a context, but ultimately they have agency, they have choice. And so when we as parents think of our children's choices, their successes, their failures as merely outcomes or reflections of us, we've turned them into an object. There's a, there's a risk that I think of. This is not doctrine. This is not gospel or canonized scripture, but this is this thought that I have that one of the, the things that we put on our children when we talk about being proud of them, I'm not inclined to use that phrase. I, I try to avoid that phrase as often as possible with my children and with others, is that it loads very heavily on their shoulders. It, it, it seems to be as if we're saying it's a reflection of us. Now, having said all of this, all parents objectify their children's children to, to a greater or lesser extent. So it's not, I'm not teaching this principle so that you're perfect. I'm teaching it so that there's some awareness of it. When your child throws a tantrum in a store, in a grocery store. Most parents are gonna feel some shame. There's a story in my book where I talk about a student who says something during a group process. And because of my ego, because I was thinking about him as a reflection of me as the group therapist, and we had some parents present, I ended up punishing him. I ended up raising my voice and yelling at him and giving him a consequence. And that was because I saw him as a reflection of me. Not a person, but a mirror reflecting back my value. Another way to think of objectification is that we see its worth as what it can do or, or what it can accomplish instead of its inherent worth, right? How smart, how fast of a runner, how beautiful, how successful that they are. And while some parents early in this process might think, think that those are great things to reinforce, the, the kinds of, of troubles that we deal with at Evoke is that those kinds of expectations, that, that, that valuing somebody because of what they can do, because of their talent or, or their gifts or the way that they look, how much they weigh, things like that, all of that has incredibly detrimental effect, effects on the child. 
um, has harmful effects on the child. So um, we, we really do try to create some distance, some detachment. We try to support the child and where they need to go. We try to own our own accountability. I was at a Boston Red Sox game. And by the way, don't hold it against me because it's my least favorite baseball team. But the stadium is iconic. I grew up a California or a Los Angeles Angels fan. We had season tickets. My uncle did. So I would go there all the time. And I hated the Red Sox because they always beat the Angels. We had some heartbreaking series against them back when I was a child. Anyway, to the story, I, I took a break because it was blazing hot sun in the middle of summer, probably July. And um, I took a break back in the shade in between innings. And when I did, when I was waiting in the shade... Um, back in the concourse, I saw what looked like a father and a son. It could have been an uncle or just a caregiver. But I saw a man and uh, a five or a six-year-old. And the six-year-old was throwing a, a heroic tantrum. And the father was kind and patient and clear and calm and soft and firm. He was everything. And the child was not very responsive to what I saw as incredibly um, clear parenting, healthy parenting. Um, and after watching this, I sat there for five minutes and I was getting re ready, ready to uh, go back down because the ending was about to start. I turned to the father and I said, hey, I, I know it's none of my business, but I've been watching you. And I just want to tell you that I think that you're doing an incredible job as a parent. And the reason I tell that story is because you can be proud of yourself as a parent for doing something well. But that's different than being proud of yourself as a parent because your child accomplishes something or because they behave well. I've told this example many times. Years ago when my son, he's, he's now graduated from graduate school, but when he was um, applying for undergraduate school, he got into the college of his choice, a uh, premier art college. And I mentioned that he was going to the, the Art Institute of Chicago. And somebody during the break, when I was giving a lecture, Somebody during the break came up to me and said, congratulations on your son. And, and it was just highlighting a moment like, I don't know how to respond to that because it's not my accomplishment. If, if him getting into art school had anything to do with me, he would never get into art school. Um, you know, my, congratulations to him. Yes. It's something he can be proud of. It's something he can feel good about. Um, but, but turning him into objects is... is placing value on their, their doing this instead of their being this, or making them a reflection or the outcome of our behavior. Taking credit for successes, and you know the other side of that, that equation. If you take credit for their successes, you have to take credit for their failures. And that's an easier one to encourage you to distance yourself from. And so you take a different position where you support them, you, you you give them what you can to help them get where they need to go. But you try to detach from this sense that how they do what they do is a reflection of you. You stop turning them into a, a light switch that has no choice in the matter. And you start to recognize the, the them as a, as a self, as an individual, as a, as a person with agency. That's the first part of that. So I, how do we not treat them as you practice? I had somebody recently ask me when I was doing some therapy training, how you avoid some, some mistakes in therapy about giving feedback or being you know, over coaching or over analyzing. And I, I, my answer was the same to you is you, you just practice. This work that we offer, that we teach, that we suggest to you is not common sense. And the dominant culture in our culture, and not just our culture, but all the cultures that I visited, the dominant culture is not going to teach or reinforce the things that, that we're talking about. If you find yourself in an Al-Anon meeting or an adult children of alcoholics meeting or an AA meeting, you're going to hear this. If you find yourself reading literature about codependency and codependency recovery, some self-help authors, you're going to hear some of this. But it's uncommon to detach yourself from your child. There's this, not just this idea, but this ideal 
in parenting that to to worry about or or to suffer endlessly for your child's struggle and pain is a is a virtue. I I, I talk about this in the book, my my new book, that that an incredible amount of anxiety for your child and their struggles is not about too much love. Helicopter parenting, I say, and I don't like that term. I don't use it to describe parents, but talking about the, this this phenomenon in our culture that gets talked about, over-involved parenting is not the result of too much love. It's the result of not enough self. And we, we conflate parental anxiety with parental love. And we have no models to show us the difference. So you go back and you you pull apart the, the programming from your own childhood to begin. That's really what, without making too grand and, and sweeping of a statement, and then I'm about to make a grand sweeping statement, Parenting a child with mental health and addiction issues is an invitation, my, my perspective, my opinion, it's an invitation to reconsider all of the programming that you've received. In essence, the child is saying unconsciously, this isn't working for me. Right? The Smith way or the Reedy way isn't working for me. And it may or may not have worked for you, but it's not working for me. And I need something different. And, and can you give that to me? Can you adjust? Can you be flexible enough? Can you consider me in the equation? So you 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 unpack your programming. You, you go back and you look critically at your family of origin and the messages, the ideas, the rules, the roles um, that were there, the fundamental foundational ideas. You look critically at all of that. You consider dismantling or, or at least deconstructing it. You listen to psychologists, therapists that you trust. You listen to parents who are further along than you in the, on this journey of dealing with a child who's struggling or in pain. And you start to develop a new idea about parenting. You really do dis discover a new way about being a, a self and being a person. So... In the words of a parent in, a, in uh, one of the last, if not the last, the second to last parent support groups that I ran before the pandemic, in the words of a father, it takes years. It takes years to unlearn and to, to relearn a new way of being with your child. That's the answer. So be patient, be kind, don't be around experts and people that are impatient with you. By experts, I mean people that know what you should do. Those are a dime a dozen. You can find lots of people that think they know your truth and what you should do. But hang out more with people who are curious, who have empathy, who could relate to the struggle. And this goes to, to the, the, the last part of this question. Isn't it normal to feel pain when our children are hurting? Absolutely. In fact, it's, it's essential to our survival as a species. If, uh, if, if Homo sapiens didn't experience the stress and pain when their offspring were experiencing distress and pain, if we were ambivalent toward it, our children wouldn't survive. Look around. There aren't, I don't know of any, if any of you know about this because you study the science of it, but to my knowledge, there's no other species whose offspring have to hang out with them for 18 years under their care and guidance, and in some cases, of course, longer. That's not other species. Humans are unique in that way, and, and I won't go into the brain science and the plasticity and what that allows us. I'll just say that's, that's very unique. So our children need us to survive. We're, we're quite pathetic creatures on our own, especially as children. So we're connected to them in that way. And then there's this... Um, all of you know this, there's this, this critical um, point at which our anxiety and our worry and what I call empathic misery 
becomes too much. And our in our instinct is to fix and to prevent and to rescue, right? And it, it often comes from a, band, a background and a context where, where pain and feelings weren't allowed, so we have no experience with moving through them, so we try to prevent the uncomfortable ones. In other words, our fear and, and our pain and our anxiety leads to control. I won't get too, I won't become too much of a nerd on this on this broadcast, but but I'll just say that's what the Star Wars saga is about. That's what George Lucas was writing about, and he was borrowing the philosophy from Joseph Campbell that we 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 think about at Evoke quite a bit. That fear, the, the avoidance of fear and pain, becomes the mental illness, becomes the problem, and learning to feel and, and move through feelings and allow and be present in our own lives. That's really what addiction is, right? That's what symptoms are. Often is there an attempt not to be present in our own lives. And if we grew up in a home where attachment was limited and we weren't soothed by our parents and taught how to self-soothe because our parents had a had a adequate sense of self themselves, then we require and ask our children not to feel pain, to be okay. And again, going back to an important premise, everybody has this more or less. So is it normal? It's normal. It's essential. It's a part of it. Um, and it's the, the last comment on this question. It's challenging for me to reconcile wanting them to be well and needing them to. And my answer to that is, yes, it is. It's a life's work. It's a life's work. For some of us, it comes more natural and easier. And for some of us, it comes with great struggle. And part of that is genetic. And part of that is environmental. Part of that comes from our context, like I mentioned. Somebody asked, what does a typical day look like for our child? Let me, do, let me talk about two different kinds of days. So there's a therapy or layover day. And that's where the therapist is out there for a couple of days a week. They get new food, new supplies. The emphasis is on, on reading and writing and individual and group therapy. They, they, it's, an, it's time to, for the new staff to come in and get their information and the old staff to leave. So those are layover and therapy days. It would look like operating you know around a campsite we try four or five days a week to move from campsite to campsite and so uh, on top of the therapy i'll talk about that and on top of the process you have everybody getting up packing up their stuff um preparing breakfast getting it ready eating it cleaning up for the breakfast mess cleaning up for the the fire pit from the night before we practice low impact camping. So we want to make it look like at the campsite that we were never there. So the staff work with the, the clients and the students to make it look like that. If we need to work at it for a while, this takes sometimes hours because if we've been there for a couple of days, it'll take a while. There might be a theme or a starting group for the day. There's often a morning meditation. There can be yoga during the day or a quiet or a guided meditation. There can be schoolwork. They can be working on their therapy, uh, therapy assignments. Every day they have something called personal time, which is their opportunity to work on one of those things that I was talking about, schoolwork. We have some schoolwork, uh, therapy assignments, writing letters home, reading letters from families. Um, there's hiking. There's the lunch break and the lunch meals. There's an afternoon hike. There's arriving at camp and then the whole thing starts over again. You have to set up camp. You have to build a fire by rubbing sticks together. They learn how to do that. You have to collect firewood. You have to prepare and cook dinner, eat dinner. You have to clean up. So all the chores are divided. Then there's typically a more formal group at night. All throughout the day, there are several mini groups. In these mini groups, we often call them standing groups because they happen while we're standing on a hike. That's how they first started, that title first started. So if somebody's upset, if there's problem solving or communication issues, 
if somebody's refusing to hike, if somebody's in a dark place, if somebody's struggling, if somebody's feeling proud of themselves, whatever it is, we have standing groups anywhere from a few to 10 per day. Each student has one staff assigned to them, so they might have their, their session during a hike during that day. Um, they might have specific group assignments. Oftentimes, the therapist, a therapist will leave three to four assigned groups for the week, and then there are, are groups that are assigned for their, their, their packet of work that they have because we work on packets, both schoolwork and therapy assignments. There's hard skills, which are things like making your bow drill fire set so you can rub sticks together to make fire. There's soft skills like using a, a sort of communication or some of your written assignments or reading assignments in therapy. So um, it's, 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 it becomes, all of it becomes grist for the mill, right? People will often ask, the therapists are out, only out there for two days, two days a week. Isn't that not enough? And the fact of the matter is so much happens. I would argue to say that more happens in the time between therapist visits than happen during the therapist days. It's true that the therapist sets the treatment plan, gives feedback, gives assignments, reviews old assignments, uh, exchanges letters to the student and client and from the student and client, and those are gone over in sessions and in discussions. But the work happens when the therapist isn't there and somebody's struggling and frustrated and homesick or reflecting on a letter or angry from some interaction during the group meditation in the morning. So everything, it's this little microcosm. It's like a little universe that replicates the large universe. And because it's small, it's, you know, anywhere from six to 10 clients, three to four staff, because it's small like that, we can focus on it. We can put it under a microscope. Clients and students will say that days go by like weeks and weeks go by like days. You'll think of something and you'll think, I can't believe that happened this morning. I thought that was two or three days ago. And in the next breath, you'll say, I can't believe it was a week has passed already. Time becomes surreal because there's, you, you, we don't have clocks out there. I mean, the staff do, but the, the students and clients don't. So it's not about hour to hour. It's about moment to moment, experience to experience. So that gives you a flavor, hopefully. There's a great book, if you're interested in kind of a, a storyteller's version of this, there's a book called Shouting at the Sky. And it was written by a man named Gary Ferguson. And I was actually in, in the field when he came out and spent a month or so with our groups. And he tell, he's a great storyteller. Shouting at the Sky, he tells it from a, a, a kind of student's eye perspective. It's not clinically rich, but if you're interested and kind of the, 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 the spiritual, cultural aspect of, of the program, Shouting at the Sky by Gary, Gary Ferguson is a fun, fun read. Somebody says, give tips for the first few days together after picking the child up from wilderness. Well, let me ask this before I answer that question, and maybe I can answer both, but do you mean coming home or transitioning to another program. So, Malia, I don't know if that's a pre-submitted question or a live question. Um, if it's a live question, you can let me know um, which, which of those two scenarios you're thinking of. Malia thinks that they mean coming home. Watch, be curious, avoid a, a, as much as you can all or nothing, black and white thinking. Expect to have challenges and, and struggles and be curious about it. Expect for regression. Focus more on your regression than their regression. Focus more on, on your skill set versus their acquired skill set. I had a mother one time. She ended up working for me for a couple of years. In fact, she's responsible for these broadcasts. She was the one that came up with this idea. Um, but her, her son, they, they were, were talking about schools, th colleges, post-programming. And, and some of his, his considerations uh, 
for the school, she thought were very immature. Not unlike the way he used to think about things before wilderness and before therapeutic school that he attended. And she said, she told me the story. She said, but I'm not, I'm not telling you this story to focus on his, but I want to tell you how I responded. And then she told me with a twinkle in her eye, um, proud of herself about how she'd responded differently and was curious. And I, I, I think that's the most important thing to get out of this is when you look at um, yourself more than your child, when you think about your relapse prevention plan more than your child's relapse prevention plan, when you think about your boundaries, your reactions, your triggers, your red flags more than theirs. Yes, uh, obviously the context is their struggles. That's the, the scene, if you will, that you're operating in. But it's the thing that you have the least amount of control over. And one of the most common mistakes that parents make is expecting it to be done and, and thinking in black and white terms, like I described earlier, like saying things like we're back at square one. We're back where we started. And you're going to see stuff that looks old. And they're going to, this isn't conscious. I don't mean this at all but they're going to unconsciously test you. I, I, I hate to do this, but it really does have some wisdom. We brought my Rottweiler. He's passed away now. He was my best buddy. We, we brought my, uh, my Rottweiler to some dog training here in the, in the Salt Lake Metro area where I live. The name of the, the dog training was called Who's Training Who, by the way. So the title was condescending, but we accepted it. Um, we dropped off Coda. We came back a few days later, a week later, maybe, and he was perfect. And we, we saw him from afar and he was sitting in their store on a little square in the middle of their store and people were walking around. And I was like, that's Coda. That's our dog. And of course, when he saw me, he left the square and I would, I'd been coached how to respond to that. And, and we started to, to work together. And I started to learn that the, the, the dance and dogs are more simple than children. And I don't want to reduce it to dog commands and behaviorism, but there's a dance. There's a systemic um, third, if you will. One plus one equals three in, in family systems theory. There's something you do together that is meaningful. So my answer is focus on you. I remember saying to a family of three one time, there was no other sibling at home. I said, I would encourage all of you as they were, he was coming home the next day. And I said, I would encourage all of you to assume that nobody else in the family has made progress. And I was doing it just as, as, a, as a thought experiment because I think it has some value to think that way. And one of the parents got really upset with me and said, I think you're being too negative and pessimistic and cynical. And I said, first of all, I don't mean it literally. And second of all, there's a, there's a, there's a, a liberation in not focusing on somebody else's change. And your child is also watching for your disappointment and they're watching for your black and white thinking. And they're feeling, if it's there, they feel the inordinate weight upon their shoulders to get everything right, to be perfect and to be cured. It's a work in progress. And Evoke gives both parents and children a, a skill set, an experience, uh, hopefully some awakening and an invitation to a new project, to a new way of being with yourself first and with each other second. So step into it. I guess humbly, self-reflectively, step into it with curiosity and without um, give yourself and your child some, some leeway. Try not to think about it as pass or fail. And if things go sideways a little bit, focus on what you can do differently.
than, than maybe the way you have done in the past. Someone says, my child has a history of holding us hostage with her anger. I know you have mentioned in a webinar um, that loving your child is not needing them to change. I do want her to change. How do I set boundaries for screaming um, and causing turmoil in the home? You can set boundaries. You can set boundaries. And, and the boundaries can be pretty significant. Evoke is a boundary. Evoke is a boundary. For young adults, not letting them live at your house is a boundary. It's, it's a big boundary, but it's a boundary. It's, you know, our children who end up in programs like Evoke, they are, and I have at least two of them, not that, that, that necessarily that end up at Evoke, but that are this way. They are champion in the game of power struggle. So that's why we encourage you to go to Al-Anon and, and Codependence Anonymous is because you learn a way of being with somebody who has potentially a, a, a helpless diagnosis. And I'm not saying your children do. I'm saying in, in Al-Anon, the premise is that you're related to somebody who suffers from the disease of addiction, which may or may not be in recovery, which may or may not be going well. And you learn how do you relate to somebody that you love that ultimately you have no control over. And children, especially children that end up in places like Evoke, are committed. They are committed to you coming to terms with the fact that you don't have control. Okay? That's their that's the agenda. So you learn how to operate within that. You learn how to set boundaries and let go of the outcome. Um in, in my first book, The Journey of the Rogue Parent, there's a chapter um called Control versus Influence. And it's about understanding that you know, setting a boundary with somebody is not trying to control their behavior, it's setting a boundary for you. The simple, trivial example is telling my child that you can't have dessert unless you eat your vegetables. But letting go of whether or not they eat their vegetables is the difference. Cajoling them and threatening them and teasing them and you know coercing them to try to eat their vegetables, that's different than saying, look, you don't have to eat them. Saying to your spouse, you don't have to stop drinking. Saying to your child, you don't have to stop yelling. But if you do those things, this is what I'm going to do. This is how I'm going to take care of myself. That's the difference. That's setting a boundary. Someone says, how do we best facilitate our son repairing relationships with siblings? Should we maybe consider a family intensive for an evoke graduate? with a parent and older siblings to work on how to communicate and work through things. All involved want to make amends, but it's tough when home is full of triggers. Graduate is 17 and recently moved to a therapeutic boarding school and sibling in mind is 21 and thinks that the Evoke experience his younger sibling had was fan were fantastic. Obviously, I'm a huge, huge fan of the intensives because I started the program and it was based on my own experience with it and I've been to I believe nine intensives myself and everybody in my family, every adult in my family has, has attended an intensive. So I'm a fan of them and it can be fantastic. Um, so that sounds like a great idea but, and supporting them and asking them what they need and, and inviting them is great. And there's a little bit in this where it's, it's kind of your job to, to have it be between them. If they feel you and your agenda of trying to get them to get along, especially if one of them is the what I would consider the, the injured party, and maybe both of them are the injured parties. But if the injured party or parties feel your need for them to get along, they're going to feel dismissed and not respected. See, an ingredient in trauma is the loss of control. And so 
when we, we try to get somebody who's experienced trauma and having a trauma reaction, when we try to get them somewhere, we're re-traumatizing them. So some of it is a step back, step back. So the words I'll use with something like an intensive or family therapy, encouragement, invitation, request, offer, those kinds of that, that kind of sensibility, I think is okay. Coercing, needing, family intensives aren't effective in, in those contexts. Now, I, I will admit, I will admit that most children come to our intensives really reluctant, really skeptical. And I will tell you this, almost all siblings, excuse me, almost all children and siblings come away from the intensive grateful for it because it was different than they expected. And they will say to me over and over and over again, if I had known it was going to be like this, I would have asked to come. And I felt like you guys, you, you, you evoke intensive staff really heard me and got my message heard. So make sure it's not your agenda too much. Make sure you let them kind of sink or swim together. Make sure your your agenda to get them healed and over their trauma or their wound is not eclipsing them. Make offers, invitations, and maybe a little bit of incentivizing. Or, you know, if your children are the kind of children that you can say, this is what we're doing, we'd like you to do it, and they'll respond to it. If you can get them in the door, even if they're a little bit reluctant, it's amazing what can happen. But 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 be aware and consider taking a step back and not trying to manage relationships between children. When you feel that you want to compliment your son and don't want to say I'm proud of you, what do you suggest is a better way of saying that? Um, great question. Um, congratulations. Nice job. You worked your butt off. Seems like you can be proud of yourself. How do you feel? What's it like for you? How is it? I'm so happy for you. Assuming this is what you want. I'm glad for you. Simple things like that. Asking them and being tuned into what what's going on for them is important. My 18-year-old, um, we were visiting, among other places, a couple of years ago, we visited MIT. And my 18-year-old is a really talented, really bright, really hardworking student, potentially capable of MIT-level work. And um, he had mentioned it as one of his thoughts, one of his schools. So we went there, and of course, me as dad, I dropped out of high school, barely got into college, and, and kind of made my way up from there. And I had this, the first of my four children was potential MIT material, right? So what did I do, of course, is I bought an MIT t-shirt and sweatshirt. And my son said to me after we left, I mean, after we left Boston, he said, I would rather you not wear that. And I said, oh, why? He said, it feels like too much pressure. And it made sense. It was my dream. It was about me. I was objectifying him. And frankly, after we did our real tour of schools last summer, and he ended up getting to the school of his choice, um, it was the perfect school for him. And MIT would have been the wrong school for him had he applied and even gotten accepted. It wasn't the right setting for him. And he could not be happier with his school choice and his acceptance and where he's going this fall. And it wouldn't be the school I would choose for me, but it would be the school I would choose for him now because it's it's the right school for him. So that just gives you some idea about like, it's there's a, children are overwhelmed with a conscious or an unconscious need to make us happy. And I know that some of our children don't look like it. They look like they're doing everything in the world to make us unhappy. But let me be clear. That behavior is evidence of the point that I'm making. They are cutting off their nose 
to spy your face. Clearly. So those are some ideas. Before coming to evoke, someone says, before coming to evoke, my son allowed himself to be manipulated, assuming they were his friends. Now at evoke for 13 weeks, he still seems to be doing the same. He seems to be stalled at wilderness. Why should I assume if I send him to an RTC that things will be different? That's between, you know, specifically to any one child. That's really between you and your wilderness therapist. I will defer to them fully. And what I will tell you is that wilderness is, it's a, it's a stabilization. It's a short-term intervention, relatively speaking, in a crisis often. It's a, it's a stabilization. It's an assessment. Um, it's often a, an awakening, which it doesn't sound like it is for your son. And then a therapeutic school or program afterwards is kind of a transition. It's kind of like real life. Students that do really well in wilderness often find themselves bored and stalling in therapeutic programs afterwards. They and sometimes their parents complain that it's not as dynamic and provocative and exciting and transformative as wilderness. And our response to that is, that's okay. It's more like life. Wilderness is dynamic. And so for you, whose, whose child is, is struggling, whatever the assessment recommendation of, of the therapist is, ask them why, first of all, same way you're asking me. Ask them to justify it. If I were to answer your, your question generically, I would say time is a big variable. The one thing that insurance companies are, are, are unfortunately aware of is that time is one of the most important predictors of effectiveness in treatment. They would like that not to be the case because time is money. That's one of the reasons why they, they look to wilderness and ask questions of us like, can you accomplish in 60 days what people accomplish in six months or 12 months? So ask your, th you deserve, all of you, you deserve to ask your therapist and your consultants tough questions and you deserve intelligent answers specific to your family, not pat answers, not practice rehearsed answers, but specific answers and answers that, that are relevant to, to your, your, your family. In general, I will say that therapeutic schools and, and programs after us are somewhere between an acute care like wilderness and real life. And, in the end, to, to, to answer your question specifically, there's no guarantee that any of this will work in the way that you're asking. You do it because it's the right thing to do for you. You do it because um, home isn't working and you're not ready for that. When I sent my son two years ago, my, my now 18-year-old two years ago, to an individualized wilderness program for the summer, my response was, when he said, what if it doesn't work? And my, my response to him was, I don't understand your question. It inherently works because you're not going to be here this summer. You're going to be exposed to some experiences and tools and skills. We're going to take a break and take a step back. And we'll cross the bridges that we come across later. But it inherently works. Conversely, in a different sense, when my oldest child, who's now 27, went to wilderness when he was 13. And eventually after four months in wilderness and a few months in a therapeutic school, I was ready for him to come home. I had people tell me he's not ready. And I said, I know he's not ready. He's 14. He's an idiot. He's never going to be ready, but we're ready. And it wasn't perfect. And it wasn't effortless and it was painful and difficult and messy and we made it through adolescence in those teen years um and it ended up being the right decision it was our decision and at one point i almost got on board with sending him away when he was 16 again but i didn't because he was talking and honest and communicating and he turned it around and he's doing great in his life right now he's happy and fulfilled and healthy so somebody asked the question what is the best way to help 13 year old sibling 
at home answer when older students ask about where her older brother is and if he's sick. Sibling not very comfortable talking about therapy. Many are asking, many asking are not close friends, just acquaintances in a small school. Um, it's very personal. You can ask, you can ask the child in, in, at Evoke what they prefer because they might have some preferences. Um, you can say he's away at a school or leadership training, which are both true. We are, in fact, we were the first, there might be others, I'm not sure if there are, we were the first to have our own licensing as a school. So he's away at a school or he's doing some adventure leadership training. You can, and all of those things are true. Nobody has a right to out you or him or them. Nobody has a right to take you out of your own private space. And I will tell you that in our family, we just talked about this this weekend. The, the, the conversation, the culture in our family is everybody goes to therapy. Every, every single child I've had goes to therapy. And my wife and I go. And so the culture in our family is therapy is what healthy people do. So you can slowly change that culture in your family. But if it's not that right now or not that in your community, I've been, you've probably heard me say, I've been with my current therapist for 21 years. I've probably been in therapy for somewhere around 30 years total. I'm 52 years old right now. My youngest, who's 12, is going, you know, I have children that, all of my children are going to therapy and none of them are in crisis. None of us are in crisis. We go the, for the same reason that people go and get a trainer at the gym or go to a well checkup with a doctor, right? We go because it's, it's a part of, it's a healthy decision that we're going to make in life. I was just listening to a podcast. Some of you might have heard, I think his name is Tim Ferriss. You might know him. And Hugh Jackman was on there and he was talking about therapy. Hugh Jackman was. And he was saying the same thing. He said, he, the example that he gave, and I don't know how old this was, but he said, Roger Federer is the greatest tennis player of all time. And he has a full-time coach. That was the example that Hugh Jackman gave. He said, why wouldn't you, if you can, have a therapist to help you through challenges in life? But that's, that's the long game. That's getting comfortable. That's changing, changing the culture in your family and in your, in your community. I will tell you this. When someone tells me that they're in therapy, if that's all I know, then all I know is that they're trying. And I will tell you this also. I don't know how to have often deep, honest conversations with people who haven't done a lot of their own work. And it's not about having no mental illness or it's not about having a great childhood. It's just you have to do your own work. You have to unravel it. So that's a different question, a different answer. Someone says, when he gets home, how do I help my son handle the judgment as many people are not empathic and instead just view him as a bad kid? Ask questions, get him support. Um, probably some of the things I was just describing about changing the culture in your family. Um, hearing him, hearing you talk about therapy, if you're willing to go to therapy, if you're willing to make your life a project in that way or go to AA or Al-Anon or Codependence Anonymous or, or, or support groups, if you're willing to read self-help literature, watch, listen to the podcasts, watch the webinars, do your own work, look at yourself, own your stuff, he won't feel like it's bad over time. Over time, you will dispel the myth that people that need therapy or get get therapy are bad and he will come to embrace what i talk about which is i'd rather be around people who have been to been to a considerable amount of therapy i, I it's they're my people i get them they get me they have depth they have explored the dark corners of their mind they're not overwhelmed by pain, by difficulty, by darkness. They are, their bandwidth is broader 
than those who haven't. So it, probably I would say develop it in yourself and let it kind of shine from there. And he'll feel it. Model it for him. Someone says if you have gaslighted your child, for example, he takes the blame for the trauma he experienced. Now he is so detached and so unwilling to engage with me or his own therapy. He just came home from Evoke and won't talk about anything. Any thoughts about starting the conversation? I'm able to try to mend the attachment, but he's avoiding the interaction. Um, if you've written an amends letter, I would encourage that. Part of what he's trying to do probably is take back control. He's probably trying to take back control. Um, so give him extra space. Let forgiveness be on his terms. A great book, and I did a podcast on it, is called Why Won't You Apologize? And his unwillingness to engage or talk about it is probably him protecting his own sovereign sense of self. You sent him to evoke. You did this big thing, and now he's saying, you can't control me. And I might not be acting out, but I'm not going to engage. I'm not going to give you what you want. You already took what you wanted without asking. My younger brother um, is two and a half years younger than me. Um, when I was about 21, I came to him and I treated him, I don't know, better than worse, better than some, worse than others. Um, but I, you know, I was a jerk older brother to him growing up. He always wanted to follow me, hang out with my friends, play with me, and I just bullied him like an older brother. So when I started to grow up and around the age of 21, I remember coming back to him and apologizing and wanting to be best friends with him. And he wasn't having it at all. And I remember being impatient and even self-righteous about it. Um, and then I remember just waiting. And I remember, remember, and it took years. I remember giving him space to, to today, you know, we're, we're, he'll turn 50 today, this year. Um, he's my best friend, my favorite person, the person I trust with my children. If I die and my wife dies, my children go to him. Um, he loves me unconditionally in my success, in my idiocy, in my failures and everything. So it takes a long time and... and Forgiveness doesn't come on the terms of the person who's done the offending. Forgiveness comes on the terms and in the time frame of the person who's been hurt. So you can write letters, you can offer, but consider space. Make the accountability about behavior and, 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 and acting out and, and even say, I get it. You know, in other words, be curious about the, the reason, the really good reason about why he's not engaging and honor that. That's the answer. And when you're curious about the symptom, instead of wanting to change it, and when you honor it, instead of judging it, you give them the space they need to come around. Someone wrote, I watched the borderline webinar. My child was diagnosed at her last residential as having borderline personality disorder. And she continues to have difficulty with regulation and relationships. She is in week eight. Is it possible this is just a phase until she matures emotionally? Of course. It's possible. It, 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 I, I don't know how old she is. Is she an adolescent or, or an adult? Um, you can um, tell me that if you're, if you're on. Um, if she's not an adult, she technically can't be diagnosed with borderline personality disorder. That's only something that an adult can be um, diagnosed with. And the reason that they 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 make that 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 line, and eighteen is arbitrary, right? I, eighteen is not really tied to the science to the brain science that we now know. You know, if we could base a lot of decisions on brain science, like legalization of drinking and driving and things like that, we would choose twenty five. We would. We just would. Um, 18 and 21 are probably just functions of, of earlier, more primitive 
times in history when the lifespan was shorter and people needed to grow up faster, but it was probably born out of necessity. But the answer is, um, yes, it, it might be a theme of hers. You know, a lot of our issues become observable themes throughout our life, but she can evolve. And if you watch my, my broadcast on borderline thinking and borderline functioning, you'll know that I think of it much more of a continuum. I think it's just healthier. Well, it is healthier. It's non-borderline thinking to think of it as a continuum instead of two piles. Diagnoses are constructs, ideas that we have made up to describe a, a set of phenomenon that seem to be consistent. But yeah, don't be in denial and don't be Pollyannish and superficial. Take it seriously. Diagnoses can help to um, guide you into how to respond. But yeah, it's not a life sentence. And, and, and all of us have styles. Every one of us has a style of responding to challenges. And so those can become themes for all of us. I think the last question I'll answer for this evening looks like we're up against the hour. What does agency mean? Agency just means choice. The ability to choose. In sports, they, they'll refer to free, free agency, which is kind of redundant. Agency is just the, the, the ability to choose, the experience of choice. I'll answer one more, Malia, because I saw one that came through. So I'll answer the one more that's on there. But no more after this one. If you can pop it up. Somebody says, one of my defenses is tone for my kids. I don't want to strip their defenses, but what about my own? How can I work with it? The fact that you can own it is a start. You guys, you, you know that you hear that I'm a fan of therapy. Um, I am biased and inclined. There are more than there's more than one ways to awareness. Um, my favorite way is therapy. I was talking to a client of mine recently, and there was a moment in our discussion where uh, he talked about feeling an old wound, feeling an old childhood theme come up for him. Not something unique. We've we've talked about it before, and he got emotional and. and he just kind of commented on it and he said, it's still there, like it's not gone. And I said, it's there, it's there. But the amazing thing is that you're talking about it. I was telling a therapist this week, you're talking about these things, you're exploring these things. And that's because you're putting yourself in a situation for one hour a week to feel everything in a safe place where you don't have to have it all together and be right. And that's unique. And that really gives you some depth so therapy, support groups, those are my ideas. All right, folks, upcoming. These slides are a little bit dated, but all of these are still relevant. If you want to learn more about our, our intensives online, please email intensives at evoketherapy.com or go to the website. We now do them online, and we're doing them in person with testing. Uh, I got COVID tested last week. I will get COVID, COVID tested before my next um, live, live one. We have access to... To, to test that we can get. So, and, and participants, if they come live or COVID tested as our all staff. Um, the next in-person one is July 22nd through 26th. So we're really hoping for that. One thing I wanna say, I wanna say our staff are amazing. My daughter, the senior staff member is amazing. Somebody said the other night that they've been to a, an intensive with me and without me with, with Emma Reedy and they love both of them. So our staff are gifted. It is the Evoke way. Um, of doing it and it's different than other programs. So I stand behind, I always, I never endorse um, something that I don't believe in and I believe in our staff and our way of doing it, the Evoke way. We have a Pursuits Adventure trip coming up, a scheduled one. So if you want your child, adolescent child to do some therapy light or some leadership, some activities, August 16th through 23rd is a Hiuentas, Utah backpacking trip, a seven day pack, backpacking trip. They're also private 
scheduled intensives anywhere from three to 30 day. Contact Sarah at evoketherapy.com if you're interested. We would like, um, we have parent support groups. Um, one is tomorrow for wellness therapy alumni parents or current parents. Either Mike Mean is doing the one tomorrow night at 6 p.m. Mountain Time. The next intensive support group is August 11th. Um, so if you want to check in, these are great Zoom meetings to check in with since we're not doing live ones. We'll continue to do these even after we travel. So if you want to find out more about our parent support groups or our alumni support groups for intensives, please contact Malia at evoketherapy.com. We ask all current parents to go to six 12-step support groups. So if you haven't gone, start now. Any combination of Al-Anon, CODA, Families Anonymous, Adult Children. Just Google those and find meetings in your area. And during COVID and during the pandemic, you can attend them virtually. You can also go to refugerecovery.org or nami.org to find out other options of, of classes or resources in your area. My two books, The Journey of the Heroic Parent and The Audacity to Be You are available on Amazon. I just got back the audio version. I'm having the, the forward recorded by the author, I hope, uh, who, who wrote it. But but I recorded the, the, the audio book for The Audacity to Be You and that'll be available soon. All right, the next, um, the next intense, the next, excuse me, the next broadcast will be, what did I say, Malia, did I say Monday? Monday of next week? That's the 20th. So Monday the 20th at 7 p.m. Mountain Time, and Malia and I will send out the topic tomorrow. So we'll get that out to you. We hope these are helpful points of contact. If there are any leftover questions, we'll, we'll take them to our next question and answer. Take care, folks. Thank you for and on behalf of your child for willing to jump on and listen to this and make your life a project. Take care. Talk to you next time. Bye-bye.